everyone. Uh, on behalf of the mission committee here at First Presbyterian Church of Morristown, I want to thank you for attending and welcome you to our first ever virtual mission event, the Great Commission Missionopoly. My name is Mike Baker, and I'm the current chair of the mission committee. We're excited to have our missionaries on this panel from around the world, including Greece, India, and all over Africa. This is the final piece of Missionopoly, and we hope that you've enjoyed the devotional, the videos, the game, the, the game and trivia night. Some quick housekeeping. Uh, this is for all of us that are, that are participating in today's meeting. We're asking that everybody in the audience uh, to please mute their volume and audio. Uh, if you go to the three bars in the top right corner and go to speaker view, you'll be able to see just the individual speaker. To our panelists, we know how difficult it may be getting on this panel with limitations to Wi-Fi in your country. Uh, we do expect some glitches and that's okay. Uh, if we have any, any trouble uh, with you dropping in and out, we may ask that you turn off your video and keep the audio only. Uh, so for everyone, feel free to type questions in the chat box for us to share with our missionaries. We're gonna monitor the chat box and ask them at the end of the program if time, time allows. So we'll ask our questions at the end, we'll save it for the end. Uh, so log in uh, to the second panel. Uh, it's the same uh, as this, but we're gonna ask that you log off and come back on at 2.30. So there'll be two sessions that the next one follows this one, uh, but that won't start until 2.30. Uh, but again, just log off from this session. Don't continue on. Log off and then come back on at 2.30. I'd like to open our meeting in prayer, <clears throat> so let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this time as we discuss your work throughout the globe. As we know from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20, we pray for our missionaries to speak with a bold truth, soaked with love and grace, to be an agent of change. We ask that you walk with them on this journey, that they may touch those who have never heard of your love. We pray all this in the name of the God who created us, who redeems us, and who sanctifies us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So let me now introduce our mod the moderator of our panel, uh, someone we all know well and love. Uh, Reverend Bruce Main, founder of Urban Promise and <laughs> Urban Promise International. Bruce, welcome. Great, great to be here. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely. Well, well welcome all panelists. And uh, I, I'm sure all the panelists would agree that if every church in the world was as concerned about missions as First Presbyterian Church of Morristown, the world would be a different place. And I know each of us in our different ways have been blessed by this congregation and the vision for missions. So I just wanna say thank you. Uh, and thank you for those that uh, are logging on from the congregation. And I hope this is really inspiring and you can see what's happening uh, with your mission program at First Presbyterian Church of Morristown. So a couple of ground rules. We don't have a lot of time today, so we've got to keep our answers short so that we can hear from everybody because we've got a lot of panelists. And uh, so I'm going to just ask to start today that we go around, take about 30 seconds each, introduce ourselves, uh, tell us the name of our ministry, uh, where we're located, and then just a short description of what you do. So uh, we're going to start, we're going to go all the way to India right now to see our friend uh, Ron Joy. So Ron Joy, you kick us off. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends which part of the world you're in. Uh, my name is Ron Joy Rao. Uh, you can call me Ron, probably easier to remember. Our ministry is Sneha. The name of our ministry is Sneha. It's in Northern India, in a small city called Dehradun. And Sneha is actually an acronym. It stands for Society for Nurture, Education and Health Advancement. Uh, it's a Hindi word, but translated into English, it means love. And we're working for the last 26 years in the largest underprivileged community in the city. This community has over 25,000 uh, migrant residents from across the country. And we're primarily involved in formal uh, the formal school education. We're currently educating over 1,000 children. We're also involved with skill development trainings uh, that include sewing, bag making, teaching henna, soft toy making. And we were also previously teaching uh, candle, candle making. And we're also running a very popular and successful women empowerment and girls champion program. 
And given the current situation, we're also tapping into the mental health concerns in the community, uh, which is a concern becoming more predominant and widespread across all ages during this pandemic. So that's pretty much what we're doing right now. Well, I'm gonna send the first Presbyterian jet around and we're all gonna get on it and come visit you because it just sounds awesome what you're doing. So uh, thanks, Ron Thank Joy. You. So let's go down to Greece. Uh, Nadia, how are you today? And uh, you ought to just say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself. Mute. Okay. Thank you so much. It is so great to be with you all. And uh, it is so amazing for the grace of God to be able to do that. And I am I, Nadia Yu, and uh, I work in Greece with the refugees. And uh, I want to thank Linda and Philip because they are the only church came to visit me. Of course, after that, the pandemic and nobody was able to move anywhere. But it was good. It was great that they took the time and they came to visit me. Uh, I work with refugees with uh, Perry Horses, and uh, it is an uh, organization was established through the Evangelical uh, Greek uh, Church in uh, Greece in Katerine. Katerine is a city north of Greece, a small city over there in Greece. So. That's what I do with the refugees, receive refugees and work with them. Bless you, Nadia. Thanks, thanks for sharing. And uh, we wanna come see you as well. Uh, let's go over to Salima uh, in uh, Malawi. And uh, we're gonna ask our friend Ishmael to introduce himself. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, uh, my name is Ishmael Rahim Adam. Uh, I'm from Salima, Malawi. Salima is one of the smallest towns uh, in the central region of Malawi. We live along the beautiful lake Malawi. So if you know about lakes, we are the, one of the most beautiful lakes uh, in Africa, I think in the world. Uh, it, in Malawi, I run an organization with my wife called Love Driven Ministries. Uh, we do different programs such as after school program, girls empowerment, sponsorship program, uh, community outreach. We serve in a Muslim uh, dominated community. So we go there on Fridays to do community outreach. Uh, that's a little bit of what we, we do uh, every day. Thank you so much. And it sounds like you've got a little fan in the background. Uh, so uh, Ishmael uh, and his wife have a beautiful little daughter. And uh, yeah, and, uh, we got to hear a little bit from her as well. So, uh, let, hey, let's stay in Malawi for a couple more minutes. Uh, uh, we see, I see Za from Rise Malawi. Uh, Rise, uh, Rise, Za, you want to say hi? Hi, uh, greetings. Uh, my name is Za Chijere. I'm from Malawi. I run a ministry called Rise Malawi Ministries. We started in 2008. It is one of the first affiliated Urban Promise uh, Ministries in Malawi. We do a lot of programs. We have after school programs where we work with school, and we have uh, a high school, uh, which we are working with around 350 students in our high school. We also do a lot of girls department program. Uh, girls are abused uh, in many cases in Africa and Malawi is not, uh, is one of the areas in which girls are being abused. So we kind of uh, work with the girls to give them like support for them to stay in school and graduate from high school and probably go to college. And we are also working with the uh, youth who have graduated from high school, uh, who are in transition either to go to college or figuring out something in their life. So we do have uh, programs where we are uh, supporting them to, with college application. At the same time, we are training them with different life skills and uh, uh, soft skills and some hard skills uh, for them to have at least the skill to work in the community. And we are contemplating of opening a trade school where we're thinking of uh, students who are graduating from high school giving them a skill and uh, that will help them to get employed in the community and at the same time start their own, uh, their own uh, trade in the community. So that's some of the things that we do in Malawi. 
Awesome, Za, thanks so much. And uh, do you guys want to flip over to Kenya for a minute? I mean, since you know travel so easy right now, um, <laughs> let's go to uh, Kate, uh, Kate Fletcher, and Craig from uh, Hakima Place. You guys want to say hi? Well, Kate was here, but then she disappeared. Well, since we're still in Kenya, let's go to James at Youth Promise. And uh, Kate and Craig, if you guys are, uh, can hear us, get ready. We'll, we'll, we'll go come back to you, OK? Hey, James. Hi, uh, hi everyone. My name is James from Kenya, the executive and the founder of Youth Promise. For the last years, been working with them and training them computers various before they join and uh, with COVID and in a, another moment for us to think about in program I'm ready to be James your bandwidth is low could you turn off your audio or your video okay Thank you, thank you. Um, I was saying that we have also been able to undertake some outreach program, training computer for the young people who are in the remote areas. We also do some girls empowerment program and Beatrice is in this um, meeting. I'm sure she may have some moments to talk to you about that. So that's, pretty much of what we've been doing for the last three years. And um, I'm thankful for everybody's support. Thank you. James, thanks so much. And, and for those of you who missed the first part of what he was saying because of the connection, you know, he really focuses on uh, computer literacy with young people and, and has developed a really, really fascinating program uh, there. Uh, Kate or Craig, are you guys, uh, can you hear us? Can you jump on and give us a little update what's happening at Hakima. Hi, this is Craig. Sorry, I was actually supposed to be just the Kate's backup and stand-in. So apparently, oh, looks like Kate. Maybe. I'm trying to unmute. Can right. you hear yeah. that? Kate, your, connect, your connection's not really good. Your audio's Let, pretty well. Yeah, let's yeah. try. Can let's... you hear me? Anyway, my name is Kate. I'm an American. All right, we, we lost Kate. Craig, you want to pick it up? Sure, I'll do my best, but I can never. Let's try one. Oh. <laughs> Kate, try one more time, otherwise I'll jump in. So Kate, we, right. we, 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 we can't hear you. So, um, so let's, let's let Craig just give a little overview on, uh, on Hakima. Sure. So thank you, everybody. As I said, I was a stand-in. Nobody could stand in for Kate, if you know Kate. So I, Craig McCoas, I'm the executive director, US executive director. I'm in the Pittsburgh area. Kate is in Kenya. Um, we started, we're in our 16th year at Kima Place. And, and I believe uh, your church has been supporting us almost from the beginning, if not from the beginning. And we're so grateful for the support of that. We serve. Currently, I want to say 60 girls are in our home, in the Kima Place home, uh, which uh, ages from infant all the way through 18. And then we support them as they go on into college, post uh, high school education and adult life. Now they come to us uh, due to many different reasons, through the AIDS epidemic that's still going on in Kenya, um, other reasons, situations, home life, uh, economy, uh, they're disadvantaged and, and potentially abuse situations where they end up with us in our care. Um, two years ago, we opened, well, we built a school as a reaction. We know that education is a, a way to provide a better foundation and help secure uh, a future for the girls that are involved in Hakima Place to make empowered decisions now from a different, uh, uh, different footing in life. The school was open, Hakima Hills Learning Center, uh, actually opened right in the middle of the pandemic. So in, uh, we were open for three months. We had 40 students enrolled in pre-K through third grade. We had to close down um, and then we reopened again. 
uh, this past January. And we had over 80 students enrolled. So God is good. God had actually raised our numbers during COVID. We currently had almost capacity in our pre-K through third grade with 133 students and a waiting list for the fall when we add fourth and fifth grade. So we are uh, uh, obviously spreading God's word and, and his love and uh, we're seeing reaction in the field. Hopefully Kate could join in and give some more details because she's boots on the ground. I just hear everything from her. Greg, thanks so much. We're going to keep pressing on. we got a few more people we got to hear from. Yep. Thanks, thanks so much. Yep. Uh, let's go to Luani in Malawi, uh, Threads of Promise. Uh, do you want to just give us a little update, Lou, Lou sweet Lou? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity that we can uh, uh, share about what we are doing and also hear from other partners what is happening right now. So um, Lou, we're, we're losing you a little bit. Sorry. Hmm. Well, all right, Lou, Lou, we'll come back to you. Hopefully, we'll, that, that connection will get a little stronger. Let, let's go to Ernest uh, over in Uganda. Uh, Ernest with Seco and Lees uh, founded a dynamic ministry there. Ernest, do you want to say hi? Hello. I'm <coughs> being. Oh. Uh, all right. My friend. Not sure what to do, Linda. I, uh, Just call Lou. me Sweet Lou. Yeah. All right. Did we? Okay. We lost. Sorry, you guys. Well, let's let's go to Ernest Matsiko. Hi, everyone. I'm here with the, my wife, Elizabeth Matsiko, and we are happy to be with everyone in this on this panel praise the lord uh, we are here in uganda and uh, we are called children alive ministries uh, we are based in mukono that is 30 kilometers from kampala and uh, our activities are affiliated to everything that we do with urban promise and uh, we run programs like after school program uh, we run a school, uh, come Christian kindergarten and primary school. Uh, we run a youth program. And uh, while running all these programs, we have activities like vocational skills. We have activities like helping kids with homework. And uh, we have activities like Bible camp. And now most of our activities actually during this pandemic kind of came to a hold and we had to change our strategies. And currently at CAM schooling, we've been trying to do homeschooling for most of our kids. Um, then for after school programs, we've been bringing on, on the site, we've been bringing a few like 10 kids and we reach out to them with the word of God, support them with their education and then we drop them back home uh, we've been teaching vocational, like uh, skills, for example, baking, and my wife has been spearheading that, especially for our kids who have uh, finished primary seven, the national exams. So they are currently involved in activities like baking, and uh, soon we'll be embarking on farming, whereby most of our parents are going to be involved in income generating activities and one of them will be pigare rarely so briefly that's come and we currently uh, at our school we reach out to over 160 children and in our after school program we have now we are able to reach out to 200 children thank you very much maybe if my wife wants to say something <laughs> hi everyone hi ladies thanks for it's good to be here. Good to, good to see you, Lise. Thank, thanks, you guys. 
Uh, let me just shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to include some people that didn't get to introduce. They can introduce as they ask this question. But I think a lot of us are curious just how COVID and this pandemic has impacted you in different countries. I'm going to ask Tanashe, uh, one of the co-founders of Rise Malawi, um, you know, just from your perspective in your community of Medici, tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges associated with, with the COVID virus. You've got to unmute there, uh, my friend. Can you uh, unmute? There you go. Am I good? You're good. Thank you. Well, so yeah, COVID has been around for a while. I think our passion has always been meet the kids, you know, be with them, share all weekend with them, the after school program, girls empowerment, we want. But I think one of the major things has been changed in the government schools. So it, we have been having two shifts. So some kids will go to school at 7.30 and be back at 11.30. And then the others would, come, would go at 11.30 and come back at 4.30. So we've been running like alternate school days and for our program. So if we have fifth and sixth grade today, tomorrow we'll have seventh and eighth grade in the after school program. And the high school for the girls empowerment, I think much of it has been the economic impact as well, as well as the emotional impact, like even when girls hear about the vaccine, they have been told that if they get the vaccine, then they will never have children. And so they are so afraid about this vaccine, the COVID vaccine. Mm. And then emotionally, that doesn't work really well because we are all recommended to go for COVID. But also like in the high school, there's been a lot of just like social distancing, making our classes smaller. So if we have 40 in one class, we'd spread those in two, and then the teachers would have a lot of work to do. But anyway, in short, we've been trying to make things happen, you know, because we can't leave the kids until COVID is over. We are trying all we can, wash your hands, wear your mask, and just be present, you know. So we, we have been trying to do that. I think the biggest hit was in my community, Madisi Village, was that there was a lot of lack in the homes because then the parents wouldn't get the short-term jobs, you know, the casual jobs. And the kids themselves wouldn't find casual jobs because most of the kids were home. So even parents that afford to employ other people wouldn't employ people. And so for me personally, I would have people come to my house like every day. So I would have people asking for food from six the last time would be 7, 7.30 p.m. Mm. And so that was hard. And on a personal level, my house is always like an open house. The kids that come in after school program, the high school, can come to my house anytime, but telling them to be okay, we're gonna be outside because we need to practice social distance was so hard for the kids to take, but it worked out. So mm. it's still working. We're following the rules. Kids are coming to our programs. We're trying to keep the numbers small and just trying to make everybody come on different days. Yeah, really short. Yeah, Tanasha, thanks so much. And so, you know, we I know a lot of us in the West, we've been watching the news. Ron Joy, what's happening in India? It, it just seems overwhelming it, from, from, your, from your community. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing and, and how you're responding. Um, yeah, Bruce, it's it's uh, it's pretty bad. In fact, the rea the reality is far more uh, you know grim than what you see on the television or you even read about it in papers. Uh, the impact is far too great to put into words, and it clearly become uh, unfortunately almost like a survival of the fittest. And you would have recently heard about the black fungus, which is also uh, India has now declared that as an epidemic. So uh, the light at the end of the tunnel seems really far off right now. As I mentioned earlier, we've, we've been largely involved in education, skill development, and, and empowerment. And uh, unfortunately, it's the education part of this which has been impacted a great deal. You know, last year, we had more than 1,000 children who were enrolled in school. But over the last 12 months, during this pandemic, more than 200 students have dropped out, uh, and uh, we haven't heard from them. 
And while online education is the only alternative, but over the last year, uh, more than 400 students, uh, you know, they don't have access to either a phone or a smartphone. They don't have the resources. So it means they haven't had any sort of education for more than a year. And uh, amidst all of this, the parents have lost jobs. They're unable to afford education. Uh, they have too many loans. And, and now they're even contemplating of removing their children from school so that they can put the children to work uh, to help towards the family. Now, what we've been doing is, along with online education, uh, you know, we've, all, we've also uh, started a phone mentoring program over the last year. We've been able to reach out to more than 100 families. Our objective is, is to give a deeper and long-term support to the families and provide uh, you know, a kind of a psychosocial support to the children. Our key themes being that of hope, coping with loss, and dealing with pressure. Hmm. And uh, I think the need of the hour right now for us is, you know, our priority is to ensure we reach out to the children, prevent them from dropping out of school, uh, try to get them connected back, uh, and, and to really support uh, the families in, in either emotionally or financially in whatever way we can to help them stay afloat. Hmm. Ranjoy, thank, thanks so much, you know, and yeah, just uh, thank you for that insight. It's, it's really helpful for us. Uh, Nadia, um, I'm just curious within the refugee community uh, in Greece, how, how is this pandemic impacting your work? Uh, if you could share a little, that would be wonderful. Uh, with the pandemic, of course, well, I don't meet with uh, refugees face to face because uh, even the hospital, when I, uh, I used to accompany them to the hospital for translation, but uh, now I cannot go with them. It, it, everything happened over the phone. And for that as well, when uh, the refugees arrive to the hospital, if they don't have their personal uh, telephone and the connection so they can have the translation, so the department tell them, we cannot see you. So they send them back home. Uh, for uh, the pandemic as well, uh, the refugees are living their life by their own, all they think of, they arrive to Greece in the way to go to the promised land. But Greece is not in their mind to stay in Greece. The Greek people would like them to stay, but they don't really uh, encourage them to stay. Uh, the economy of Greece is uh, very low. They don't pay any uh, social assistance uh, for the refugees. And there is no jobs as well. Hmm. Whoever wants to work, there is no jobs. So Nadia, the refugees... Nadia I'm, Nadia, I'm just curious, where, where are most the refugees coming from? What, what countries? The most are from Syria and from Iraq. And uh, we have uh, from uh, North Africa. We have from Afghanistan and from Iran. And, and, and is the flow of refugees from Syria, is that increasing or is that, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about it. It's not increasing, but it is, it is continuing. Mm -hmm. Like uh, some people coming and they settle down a little bit for a couple of years and now they move to uh, Europe to Germany or to other country. But there are new people are coming. They are bringing them. The refugees, when they arrive, they arrive to the island. And in the island, they register them and they keep them in some sort of camps, reception camps. And after that, they move to permanent camps until the housing project uh, has empty space. They call them from the camps to sit in the houses in the city. And after that, they move to uh, all through all the program, education program and uh, uh, social programs. But in their mind, they, they uh, prepare themselves to move to other countries. They don't want to stay in Greece. Gotcha. And thanks, thanks, Nadia, for that update. Um, Kate, Kate, I don't know whether we can hear you now, but uh, we'll we'll give it another try. Just curious, how, how has, uh, you know, from your vantage point in Kenya, the, the, the COVID situation, how, how has that impacted your families and, and your ministry?
Can you hear us, Kate? All right. Well, let, let's let's switch gears. Sandy Newhall, are you there? If you could jump on for a second. Sandy Newhall. Kids, no one has been sick. Um, during the weeks that they had to stay home, we were sending money for foodstuffs so that we got. Hello. Yeah, we, yeah we're, we're we're getting a little we're getting a little now. So so keep talking and and we'll let you know if we can, can hear you. you. Not, can you not hear me? I I can hear you right now. So so uh, yeah, if you want to talk for just another minute, that would be great. Or do we lose her? Okay, Sandy Newhall, to you. Uh, a, a lot of these young leaders that are on this uh, call today are. Uh, they, they came through the Urban Promise Fellowship Program. Uh, you're the director of that now. Just, you know, if you could just say a word about that, but I think we're also curious about, you know, with, again, with the pandemic, one of the focuses of the program is bringing young leaders to the U.S. and then sending them back. Uh, how has this impacted you? Um, it actually, it impacted us quite a bit. Um, and yeah, I think, it was interesting because as the pandemic really began to uh, increase in the U.S., we it was time for our uh, cohort to go home last June and all the airports and everything locked down. Um, so we have several of our fellows who uh, stayed an extra year with us, uh, uh, got some additional training and it has been interesting to see them kind of utilize this time to get training in um, trauma care, um, in like pastoral care and different areas. And the amazing thing is through that, though we couldn't get our fellows home to do ministry, except for Ishmael, who's on this call, who is pretty determined to get home um, and has a pretty exciting story of that. Uh, we were able to get uh, our current cohort here to the United States. So I always tell them that God definitely wanted them here. We jumped through several hoops, um, had to do special appeal processes to get visas, uh, embassies opened up for them. So that it's, it's been a challenge, but it's been kind of fun to see God work through it. Yeah, Ishmael was pretty determined to get home. I think, uh, I think he's found the only flight to the continent and then busted home or hitchhiked from uh, Zambia to Malawi. But uh, we'll hear about that another time. Uh, Za, in, in, uh, in, in Malawi, I, I'm just curious, what would you want people in the West to know about what's going on in your country? Like what, what should we be aware of? Yeah, uh, a difficult question. But uh, one thing, uh, like the moment I've been in the USA and uh, growing up in Malawi, we are totally different. Uh, economically, uh, we have fewer jobs in Malawi. So with the COVID, people are losing the few jobs that they had, and uh, which is uh, becoming worse, especially in the villages. We have the whole village uh, without a job without an income. And these people, they have to send their kids to school when they, have don't, they, when they don't have money. And uh, with the closing of schools, uh, most of the students had no access to school for over a year. Like in uh, India, we don't have access to electricity in the villages. Uh, we don't have access to smartphones. So when COVID came, everything shut down. Uh, people lost their jobs. Uh, they had no alternative to finding uh, money. So what I want people to know is that as uh, local ministries, we are trying to create uh, a generation uh, where uh, they are becoming more educated uh, and they are moving out to the city, finding jobs. And with the jobs in the city, they are able to support their parents back in the villages. So we believe with more uh, of educated generation, uh, we will create more economic opportunities uh, for, for the community and for young people in the community. 
So fantastic. And, and I think we, we need to give a little shout out to Zah, maybe a little hand clap. Uh, he just uh, received his PhD this past week. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to fly to the US to, to walk the stage, but uh, uh, I th and I think we'll get the diploma to you pretty soon, but uh, we just want to say congratulations, uh, Zah. Uh, no, no, uh, no simple accomplishment. And uh, you actually may want to read his dissertation because I think it's a pretty fascinating dissertation. So you can you can send him an email if you want a copy of that. Uh, uh, Ernest Matsiko, just um, just from your perspective, what would you want people in the West to know? And then I, I want to open it up to the floor if if you've got a question for anybody uh, on the call, um, you know, just type it in the in the in the chat space and uh, we'll, we'll direct the question to our panelists. So uh, Ernest, what, what would you want folk in the West to know about what's going on in, uh, in Uganda? Yeah, one in Uganda, we are equally sharing the same problems with Za in, in Malawi. <laughs> what I would like people to know is that most of our families, their parents lost their jobs. And most of our kids actually, uh, right now the government is trying to reach out to NGOs like CAM and other NGOs to make sure they sensitize communities so that kids can go back to school because most kids are no longer interested in school. Uh, that's something that is shocking for our kids. Like most of them got jobs like building construction, they were potters. Others got married during the pandemic and I'm giving a general picture of Uganda, not just come. And uh, uh, most of our parents, some of them, the few who had jobs and income generating activities, they have not been able to sell because at some point, most of their goods were rotten in their houses. And so what I would like the rest of the world to know is that we need each other after and during this pandemic. And I know the pandemic, like in Uganda right now, I can assure you most of our parents can't afford the, what's that, the vaccine. Yeah, I, I mean, they can have, I think they are willing, they are not willing to have the vaccine because I think the government is giving it for free, but most of our people are going to learn about the vaccine. So, you ask someone like, have you received yours? And they are like, no, I'm scared. So it's kind of shocking for all of us. Like, what is the next step? Where are we going? Yeah, briefly, that's what I can say. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. I, you know, I'm just wondering, is Andy from the uh, Medical Benevolence Foundation? Is he on? Uh, no, so we, we don't have Andy. I think we lost Beatrice at some point. I'm sorry we didn't get to hear from her, um, but I, I don't see any questions in the chat space, but it, it, does anybody just wanna, uh, any of the panelists wanna jump on and raise their hand and, and ask uh, any of our uh, distinguished guests? Uh, yeah, Kate. You're still muted, Kate, sorry. Mute, it throws me away. It throws me out altogether. Am I oh. here now? Yeah, you're here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I live in Kisarian, which is on the escarpment of the Great Rift in a children's home I founded in 2005. The government is trying to close children's homes. They want the kids all to live in family, which is wonderful if they have family. So we're stuck trying to reintegrate those who can be, and yet we're accepting seven new children this week who have been abandoned. So go figure where that's gonna go. Right next to ourselves 
in 2018, we started building a, a school because we live surrounded by Maasai people. And that's the tribe that still cuts their girls and gives them at 12 and 13 uh, to 50 year old or 60 year old men who will give daddy a lot of cows for the trade off. So we're hoping to build a, a dormitory when we take sixth, seventh, and eighth grade so we can keep the girls out of daddy's sight. We started school last January and were shut down in March. Then we opened again this January. We have 130 kids in three primary grades and in first three of the regular primary year starts. We're going to take class four and five. And we have a lot of life skill. We have a lot of life skills rooms to which the parents will be happy to come. Is that the end of my time? That little dinging noise? <laughs> okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Kate, thanks. Thanks for the update. Uh, <laughs> you know, just to, uh, somebody asked a question, and, and maybe a couple of you re could respond to this. And maybe I'll ask you, Ron Joy, first. You know, it, I, I'm, I'm assuming from what you shared earlier, you know, you're, you're seeing death, you're seeing, you know, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of issues that your community is confronting. How, how are you personally sort of taking care of yourself emotionally? And do you see this taking a toll on you as a leader? Um, I, personally, I think, you know, my priority is to keep my, keep my parents at home. Uh, you know, both my parents are, you know, uh, more than 70 years old so uh and you know uh, you know as a son it's my priority is first first to keep them at home keep them alive because uh it, it's not safe out there you know so uh, saving life and preventing you know loss of life i think that's priority uh and i think we just you know i i also think that at this time where you know and we're, we're back in a lockdown situation again and it's very strict uh, we're not getting out of the house so uh, right now i think as, as a leader you know not only for you know the children, I think even for my staff to, to keep them motivated. Um, you know, it's, if I don't keep them motivated, they're not going to be able to keep the, chil the, the children motivated, motivated or the community motivated. So uh, they're my first line of, of, of people that I need to reach out to. Um, and you know, it's important to keep, keep ourselves occupied and keep everybody occupied as much as possible because uh, you know. This this staying at home and lockdown requires a lot of discipline as well, which I keep telling people that you know you need to you need to be disciplined, you need to have a schedule. You can't just be idling around all day long. So, um, you know, and and stay positive and have positive conversations. And that's why we have this phone mentoring program where we reach out to people and talking to them, um, and so that they can just share. It. Sometimes you just need somebody who can just hear you out, uh, regardless of whether you have a solution for their problems or not. Mm. So we're just trying to be the ears of. Uh, you know the community and 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 one another and and I, I've told everybody, even the children, that uh, you know stay connected with uh, uh, with people as much as possible and feel free to call us up anytime. You know my phone's on through the night, so if anybody needs any any help, whether it's oxygen, whether it's uh, a hospital bed, whether uh, they need medication, whatever it is, uh, we need to be available to try to if we can't provide the resource, at least provide the information of where they can go to get it. Right. Tanasha, you you had mentioned that you have you know you're you're I know where you live and you're surrounded you, you know people have access to you twenty four seven you know and obviously you know the the need for what you're offering has increased uh, people knocking at your door more like how how are you sort of taking care of yourself personally? You got to unmute for us. Can you unmute? Am I good? Yes. All right. Yeah, I'm trying to take care of myself. So especially, yeah, I'm praying for myself. I'm asking for prayers. And the other thing too is just to read more books. So I asked for books from Miss Dina Newman. She sent me some books written by Bob Goff. You know, Bob Goff writes. He's just so alive when he's writing. Um, I'm reading um, <laughs> Big Dreams right now. Dream Big right now. So that, that's me. And I started also reading our um, leaders eat last. I don't want to eat last, but 
I'm <laughs> and the other thing too is just to talk about what is it, you know, because most people in the village don't know what actually COVID-19 is. So talking about what is it makes them understand what it is so that they can take care of themselves while taking care of me in the same place. But also I, I talk to people a lot, like on the phone, check on them through messenger, try to find out what's going on. And I'm telling the kids to stay strong because the disease might stay longer, but it might also stay shorter. But I'm also telling them to be resilient because on top of the poverty that they are already, you know, living in, there's this disease that's bringing more poverty. So we are talking about it so that they don't lose hope, you know, they can still stay in school, they can continue working hard. And it was sad to see how much hope was lost when COVID hit Malawi, because kids would hear, on, would hear like maybe on the radio who died, maybe when they go to school who died. So they would hear about people that had died, but also how they, most of my girls, like I know, I know from primary school about five, so grades five to eight, about five in our after school program, got married because they said, well, why, why keep staying in school when there's not going to be school anymore? So even that one year without school was the big message that there is no hope for education, get married. So I'm talking about it like, hey, life is still continuing. We can still hope, we can still plan. We can still be dreaming and God is taking care of us. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. Tanasha, thank you. Um, I don't know whether James, how your connection is in, in Kenya, but do you wanna, you wanna say a word about sort of how you're trying to take care of yourself and, and maybe your team? Can you hear me, James? Hmm. All right. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll jump over. Uh, Courtney, how are you doing? You got a question for any of these uh, these panelists before we wrap it up? We just got a few minutes left, and we're. Uh... No, I'm doing. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, everybody, for hopping on today. Thank you, everybody, for for being here and for the work that you're doing. It's it's not easy, but it is amazing work. And so we're just really thankful for everything you guys are doing. Well, thanks, Thank Courtney. And yeah, we're, we're gonna, uh, Linda suggested that we, you know, just pray for you guys. And uh, just before we do that, uh, any of our panelists wanna say a last word? Uh, oh, Lise wants to say something in, in Uganda. So Lise, uh, jump on and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pray for you guys and, and let you go. One thing that one of the, the many things we've been doing has been to train the children in vocational skills. So uh, one of the ideas that came to our, our hearts was while the children have a lot of time because they've been out of school for almost a whole year. So uh, while schools are opening now slowly. They, they've had a lot of time and some, some of the children have just, like how my husband said, they lost, they lost interest in school. But for us, we've been encouraging them to go to school. But while thinking, how about any gifts like God has given you? For example, can you, can you learn a skill? So we, we, we had, we have the children who finished their uh, primary school. So we decided to give them the opportunity to learn baking, learning how to make books and learning how to make liquid soap. And it has been amazing because they are very, very enjoying and, and it has been opening our minds to know that Life is not just about school, but how, how about something else that you know? So they've been uh, doing very well. So you can check out our Facebook and you can see what's going on. Yeah. 
Lee, Lee, thanks so much. And, you know, one of the things that's impressed me, you know, and even with this group uh, is that a year and a half ago, things were uh, really crashing around us. And I know as a leader, uh, you know, trying to, you know, mitigate anxiety uh, on your teams. And I think Ron Joy, as you said, you know, helping people kind of shift gears and refocus and develop, um, you know, schedules and, and just uh, not sink too far into despair. And, and the fact that all of you have survived the past year and a half uh, leading organizations uh, I think is extraordinary. And I know within the Urban Promise orbit um, of our 29 locations around the world, we haven't had one close. Uh, you know, and to be honest, last March, I was wondering whether we would survive. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I've seen, and this happens, I think, in organizations where you've got very passionate, mission-driven people, you know, is that during crisis, they, you know, they come together and they lean into their values and their faith and they innovate and they adapt. And again, you guys have all had to do that uh, this year. So I, I know just, I'm grateful. Um, it's a real honor and privilege to just hear a little update uh, from each of you. And, you know, I'll just close this with a word of prayer and then I'll turn it back to Linda and Mike if they wanna say a last, uh, a last word. So let's pray, gracious God. Uh, we thank you for the miracle of technology that uh, from multiple countries we can come together on this Sunday afternoon and uh, just encourage one another and to celebrate uh, some of the accomplishments of the last year, but also uh, just share some of the, the real honest struggles that we're having. Uh, and so I pray that you'll continue to provide uh, for each of these ministries that you would protect these leaders, uh, that you would renew them, replenish them, and uh, just give them and help them to find joy in their work despite these very difficult circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in right now. So we, we thank you for your goodness, and uh, we pray all this in Christ's name. Linda and Mike, back to you. So I'm going to thank everyone for being on here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and also um, to each of you as panelists for taking the time. I know some of you it's later at night and this has been wonderful seeing all of you. Also, um, I guess I could probably put my audio on or my video on, you'd actually see me. But um, before we leave, we wanna remind you uh, that we will be back at 2.30 for our next panel and you will need to sign off and sign back on. And also we will be having a shredding event on June 5th from 8 a.m. or from 9 a.m. to noon in our large parking lot, which is a benefit for two of our missions. So we hope you'll come to those two. And again, thank you so much, Bruce. I'm just curious, Linda, what is a shredding event? I, I read that and I, I've never heard of one. So it's, it's a new kind of fundraiser. <laughs> It's, you know, it's funny, um, our missionaries from across the globe probably wouldn't understand that, but Americans have a lot of paper that is confidential that when they were going to throw it away, it should be shredded. So that's what our shredding event is. Well, there, there you go. I, you know, you learn something new every day. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good to see you all. Blessings. <laughs>